So we've been working through this series um, called Like Christ and uh, for the last several weeks. And so like the, the premise of this, it, it's kind of a loose connection of messages that are, uh, are, we're just looking at 10 different areas in which you can see your Christian faith come to maturity. And so like we're asking, what does it mean to be like Christ? What does it mean to be like Christ in, in how I experience the church? What does it mean to be like Christ and how I experience the Father, uh, the, the Holy Spirit? And so today we're going to talk about, like, what, it, what does it mean to experience calling and purpose in my life like Jesus did? And uh, so I want us to look at how Jesus understood himself, like why he came here, why he existed. Like what, what, was, what did Jesus see as his purpose? Um, because I want to give you an opportunity to, uh, to, to consider why you're here, like big picture, like why are you here, like why do you exist at all? I guess that's a huge question, right? A huge question because it's just, just so big, but also a huge question because it's really relevant to the way that you live your life. It gets the kind of question that you reflect on. So the, like, we need to consider that question because the answer matters. And this is one of the greatest beauties of Christianity, right? Like, Things are for a reason. Maybe not, so maybe not everything happens for a reason. Maybe things are just sometimes bad because we live in an ugly and broken world where bad stuff happens. But, but we live in a broken world with a point. We live in a broken world that, we live in a broken world that's going to be whole someday. That, that's what you're hinging all of your bets on. If you've stepped into the kingdom of God, you're placing your faith in this one true king because you believe that he has a plan for the world. You believe, you believe in that plan. It is your great hope. We have a king who acts with a purpose. This is really critical. This is the narrative. This is the, this is the story that we believe in, the great story of the Bible, that, that the earth was formless and void and the spirit hovered over the chaos, over the emptiness. And God, who was outside of it all and was perfect within himself, decided to create something out of that nothingness. And so he did. And it was good. But his creation, his creation rebelled against him. And from that moment, the world's been broken. It's been bound by this, this ugliness of sin and, and death. And you've felt the bitterness of that ugliness. Like you felt it. You felt the teeth, the despair of that sin and death as the world reverts back to the formlessness and the void and the chaos. Like you've seen the rebellion of nature and the walls of water or wind or fire that, uh, that destroy and bring death. And you felt that rebellion inside of yourself, too, in the moments when you really want to do the right thing, but you just don't find it in you. You find yourself constantly messing up. The world is in rebellion. It's broken. And since that very first day when sin was conceived, God has been laboring towards an eternity of perfection towards a moment when when everything is right again. Uh, John writes in the book of Revelation, as God showed him, uh, and then an angel showed me the river of water of life, as bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. And on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit was yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of that tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be written on his, their foreheads, and the night will be no more. They will need no light, no lamp, Uh, They would need no sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Like this, that, that is God's purpose. God is moving to this place where night and darkness 
is, are finally and completely and fully vanquished. And you know what happens then? Did you, did you catch it in the text? His servants will reign with him forever and ever. Who are they? His servants. That, that's us. Uh, those are his people. Uh, like this language is littered throughout the New Testament. He intends not only for us to be his subjects, but for us to rule and have dominion with him as it was in the beginning. That's the moment we're moving to, which is really huge because that means that he doesn't just have a grand purpose for the world and the universe and the earth. Like he actually has a grand purpose for you too. Like he's moving you towards something and, and it's a noble purpose, like, like a truly noble purpose. He wants you to be nobility in this new heaven and this new earth. Like we're gonna roll alongside, of, alongside him. And so that's foundational to the gospel. Jesus has a purpose for you. So what do I mean by purpose? Um, let me explain it like this. So my title here at this church is Outreach Pastor. And so what is, what is my purpose on this staff? What is my role? Why, why do you employ me? Uh, my purpose, of course, uh, so first and foremost, I'm a pastor, and, I, and my purpose is pastoring you all. And so in my day-to-day -day life and my conversations with you, um, I sense and follow the, uh, the instruction of the Holy Spirit to listen to you and understand the struggles that you have in life and to equip you towards every good work and to teach you and to encourage you. Like you can call on me and I will answer you and I will do my best to point you towards a life that is like Jesus's. Like that's, that's my purpose because I'm a pastor. And at T Free Church, I'm this special kind of a pastor they call an outreach pastor. So they put that title in front of my name to let, to let you know and to let me know that like, every time I'm in a room, it's my job to be thinking about the people that aren't in that room. Like, that's what I do. And so it's my role here to be thinking, how do we reach out of our spheres, our common everyday, uh, the people that we see, the people that, co that come here every Sunday morning? Like, how do we reach outside of that and share the good news of the kingdom with people that, that wouldn't hear it otherwise? That's my purpose on staff. And so every time I walk into a room, that's... That's what I think about. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm paid to think about. Like in staff meeting, everything that I hear passes through this filter of like, how does this affect how we're reaching our community? Every, every time I'm in a board meeting, every time I'm at a daycare board meeting, like this is the kind of filter that I need to hear everything through is how does this affect our community? Uh, at Colonial Machine Company, my day job, I'm a quality engineer. And so like my purpose as a quality engineer is to ensure that the parts and the paperwork that we give to customers are in compliance with, with regulations and with our own quality program and with any kind of uh, specifications that they might give us. Like, it's my job to ensure that they get good parts and good paperwork and that we have systems in place so that they never get bad parts or bad paperwork. And so that's my purpose. That's what I'm always thinking about. Every time I'm in any, any conversation on the job, it, it is my responsibility to be thinking like, well, like, how, how is an auditor going to see this? What's an auditor going to ask us? Like, how do I make sure that we can't get bad parts to our customers? Uh, that's, that's my role. And so, so let me get into the terms that I'm using a little bit, um, because I think, that, I think that any time you hear any two people talk about calling and purpose, they're gonna be talking about uh, slight, slightly different things and mean slightly different things by the word. So let me just tell you what I mean by them. Um, I want to suggest, at least for the purposes of tracking this morning, that things like, things like outreach pastor or quality engineer, like those things are my calling. Those are specific areas in which I work out my purpose, areas in which God has called me to work out my purpose. Uh, and they're not the only types of calling. Like those also happen to be my vocation. But calling isn't always vocation. It isn't always your job. Um, so like... Sometimes calls are placed uh, upon, upon you in like your responsibilities um, or in your families or in your hobbies. Um, but in this particular arena, it, it, calling is the particular arena in which you work out your purpose. And so it's tied to you. It's tied to your specific giftings and your specific passions. The way that God calls you as individual, um, he calls you in personally. Um, purpose is bigger than that. Purpose is something that's common to all of us. 
And as, we're, as we will find as we discuss this later on, um, purpose is really us living into the purposes of God. God doesn't have a purpose for you. He has a purpose and we participate in it. And so, so let's say that you have accepted Jesus as the one true king of the world. You're a Christian. Like, what is your purpose? What does it mean to have that role of daughter of God or son of God? I want you to see that this has, this has less to do with like your actions, what you do, and, and it has more to do with your orientation, how you think about things, how you see yourself and the world around you. Like, you'll notice that when I described my position as an outreach pastor or as a quality engineer, like I told you very little about what I do on a day-to-day. Um, like I didn't get into any of the nitty-gritty about organizing events or facilitating things or like cleaning up after pie making classes. I didn't talk about any of that. And I, I uh, am not going to get into what it looks like when I talk about uh, being a quality engineer because you'd all think I'm very, very boring. <laughs> like, I, I didn't talk, of, it's way more exciting to talk about my purpose than it is to talk about some of the things that I do. Uh, but, but it's more than that. Like, uh, our, our purpose is, is about our mindset. It's not about the specific things that we do, it's about how we go about doing them, and it's about how we think about them, and how we think about the world and our place in it. Um, my roles aren't my purpose. Being a pastor is not my purpose in life. Being a quality engineer is not my purpose in life. They're jobs, and they're jobs that I have, and they're callings that I have. And I have them for, for a purpose, but my purpose is tied up in me being a son of God, not in me being a pastor, or me being a quality engineer, or me being the fiance to Julia, or the son of Lane and Kelly, or the brother to my siblings. Like, my, my purpose is related to my primary role as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And I have callings that tell me how I work out that purpose. That, but that role is why I'm here. And it's the, it's the driving motivator behind every part of my life. And so I want us to look at Jesus. Um, I just, we're going to take like a whirlwind tour through the book of Acts and just look at several places where I think that, that Jesus talks about um, but his identity and his purpose in being here because I think that it's instructive for how, how we can be like Christ in seeing our purpose and place in the world. And so I'm going to start in Luke chapter uh, 2. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, towards the end of Luke chapter 2, Jesus is 12 years old. And so uh, Jesus' family went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover with all their family and friends like they always did every year. And uh, so... Feast of Passover is let over, and Mary and Joseph pack up to go, and they leave, and they think that you know, Jesus is with them, and just bouncing around another part of the caravan, and it like, turns out they get settled in for the, light, for the night, and Jesus isn't there. And so, like, they panic, as you would, and um, so they are looking for him and hunting for him, and they go back to Jerusalem, and they hunt for him for three days. I'm sure they were panicked. I'm, I'm pretty sure my parents would have killed me. Um, but they found him. They found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And his mother asked him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And Jesus said to them in the first time that he, he really expresses his own purpose, he says, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I would be in my father's house? And this is the first lesson that we have to learn, I think, about about our purpose. I think that as we become new Christians, this, this is the first thing we learn about why we are here. Part of why we are here is just to be in our father's house, to sit and to learn and to ask questions. That's part of your purpose. That's part of our purpose as Christians, uh, to sit and to learn the ways of the Father, 
and who he is and what he desires. Like when we first start out, we don't need to have some grand sense of calling and what God's going to do with our life. Uh, like it is a grand enough sense of calling uh, to know that God wants us to know him and to know what he cares about and what he loves. And so like we might, we might not even start out thinking about Christianity as like as this thing where we have some great purpose. We might, we might start by thinking that we're buying into this club because God can do something for us and serve our purposes. But the first thing that God asks of us as believers is to just sit and learn, to be in our Father's house. It's also worth noting that the next thing that Luke talks about in Jesus' journey is uh, when Jesus is getting baptized by John the Baptist. And I really love this bit. So uh, when Jesus said, so this is what the text says, um, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven saying, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. You are my beloved son. With you, I'm well pleased. This is remarkable because this is not after Jesus had done a bunch of really good stuff and healed a bunch of people and cast out a bunch of demons. This is the start of his ministry. Like this, this is his commissioning. Jesus is sent out in the world uh, to do the work of the kingdom. And the first thing, the way that it starts is, you're, you're my son and I love you. Like that... That's the place where we start. Because, because this is part of how Jesus experienced his purpose and part of how you should experience your purpose too. Like, the first experience God wants you to have of what, what, why you were here is to be loved. Like, it's not about anything that you need to do. The first thing that God wants you to know is that you are loved. And so that's how you start. Like it starts by receiving. You are the beloved of God. Start there. You'll have things to do, but, but know that you are loved. And that's the moment that Jesus started his ministry. And he did. He, he started preaching and teaching and healing people. And uh, so Luke tells this story in chapter 4 about a time when, when Jesus was teaching in the synagogues and like he was wont to do. And so uh, Luke 4 says this, it says, and Jesus arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever and they appealed to him on her behalf and he stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her and immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now, the sun was setting and all those who had any, who were sick, with various diseases, brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them, and he healed them. And the demons also came out of many, crying, you are the son of God, but he rebuked them, because he would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed, and he went into a desolate place, and the people sought him and came to him, and would have kept him from leaving them. But Jesus said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues in Judea. He's pretty explicit here. What was Jesus' purpose? Like preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing the sick, and casting out demons, helping people with real tangible problems. That's Jesus' purpose. As he enters into ministry, like he starts living out the things that he learned in his childhood about God's desires. People have needs, and, and he meets every single one of them in this story. As, as you advance in your faith towards maturity, like your experience should, should be like this too, will be like this too. As you progress, like you should begin doing the work of the kingdom. Uh, you should begin healing and casting out demons, sure. But, 
not, not just because that's cool and sounds pretty sci-fi, but because of what those ministries represent, like meeting people's real and experienced needs, making people's lives better, and sharing the good news of the kingdom. That, that is Jesus' purpose, and that's your purpose as well. As you progress, uh, you'll begin to throw yourself into the ministry of the church, into the things that, that the church is doing. Uh, and not, not just our local congregation, although like, we work pretty hard to give you opportunities to serve this community and to serve people. Uh, but you're throwing yourself into the ministries of the kingdom uh, and making people's, meeting people's real and experienced needs and find that those activities are a place where you're fulfilling your purpose, where you feel fulfilled. And later on, so Jesus is continuing this work. He keeps healing people. He keeps casting out demons. He keeps meeting people's needs. He feeds 5,000 uh, men plus women and children. And the question uh, comes, to, comes to a point. Jesus asks his disciples, after he's just got done feeding the 5,000, he asks the disciples, uh, who, who do people say that I am? Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answer, some say, People think that you're John the Baptist, or people think that you're Elijah, or one of the other prophets come back from the dead. But Jesus asks them, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Christ. You are, you are the world's one true king. And Jesus strictly charged and commanded them not to tell anyone, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Whoa. So that took a sharp turn from healing and from preaching and from meeting people's needs to a bigger purpose. Like dying and being raised from the dead and saving the world is a lot bigger of a purpose. And so there's some good news here. Like, you don't need to save the world from their sins. You can't do that. But there is an important thing for us to, to learn here uh, that's, that's relevant to you. Like Jesus is pointing out to his disciples and to us that this is a lot bigger than feeding 5,000 people. This is a lot bigger than healing people from diseases. It's a lot bigger than casting out demons bigger than saving lives and performing miracles. Like, this is bigger than anything that we do as a church, any, any, any of our activities or any, any of our, um, our various ministries. This is bigger than that. Uh, the kingdom that he is preaching is going to last forever. And the here and now is just a small piece of it. And so Jesus knew what his purpose was. He knew that his purpose was to play a role in the ultimate plan of salvation for the world and God's restoration and redemption of his people. Like his role was, was the role. Like His role was the literal crux of it all. But you and I also find that understanding our purpose evolves as we mature into Christ. From understanding our purpose and why we are here to understanding God's purpose and joining him in it. And seeing that our lives... And our purpose is just a piece of the bigger picture, an important piece of the bigger picture, and the ultimate effort to restore the world to him. And so fast forward to the end of Jesus' ministry. Um, the time came for Jesus to be handed over to the Romans and for crucifixion. And so on the night that he was arrested, he went up to the Mount of Olives, as, as he always did, and he, uh, he left his disciples about a stone throw away, and he began to pray. And as he prayed, he was in agony, praying more and more earnestly. And his sweat came out as drops of blood. And his words as he prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours. Like, this is the pinnacle of understanding the purposes of God. 
Like Jesus taught his disciples to pray very early on, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, on, the, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus is living into that prayer. Like he knows he is loved and he's learned the ways of God and he is participated in the works of the kingdom and he understands the story and the purposeful way that God is moving this world towards redemption and restoration and he knows his role in it and at this moment at this ultimate time he relinquishes himself into the hands of the father that's what it means to be mature in Christ it is the point where we don't hold any of our desires any of our own purposes so closely that we will not allow God to take them trusting that he will do with them what is good for us and good for the world and for our flourishing like when your will is relinquished and you are holding fast to the will of God his great scheme of restoration and redemption like that that is the moment when when God's will begins to permeate every part of who you are that's the moment when what he is doing starts to enter into every thought that you have and it becomes the filter through which you see the world like th this is what Jesus is saying in John 5 when so he just got done healing the invalid by the pool of Bethesda and so he's getting pushed back from uh, the religious leaders saying like you can't do that on a Sabbath you're working on a Sabbath that's no good and Jesus says like, very truly I tell you the son cannot do anything by himself he can only do what he sees the father is doing because whatever the father does the son does also Whatever the father does, the son does also. The son can do nothing by himself. He's only doing what the, he sees the father doing. That is, that is what maturity in Christ looks like when it comes to calling and purpose. It is recognizing that we can't do anything by ourselves. We only do what we see the father doing. And so just like as, as an outreach pastor, my purpose is to think about the ways that we share the good news with the people outside of our congregation. And just like as a quality engineer, my job is to think about any possible ways that anything can go wrong that might prevent us from getting quality compliant parts to our customers. And just, just as those purposes shape everything that I do in those jobs, like they change what I do and how I do it. Our calling begins to our give, us, give us definition. Um, and our purpose begins to shape everything that we do. And so we recognize that we are sons and daughters of God and he is moving this world towards this great moment of redemption and restoration. And that permeates every part of our lives and is our driving motivator in every single thing that we do. And so we have a calling in that that, that gives us the scope of our mission like we don't have to do all of the work of the kingdom it's not all our responsibility it doesn't all rest on my shoulders but in the spheres where I am active that is how I act in the spheres that God has called me to the way that I act is in understanding and in step with the will of God because that is my purpose like I am an agent of redemption and restoration in every room that I walk into because that is my purpose as a son of God. And so as a Christian, as a person who is loved by God, who is learning his ways, uh, who is blessing people and finding ways to make their lives easier, like, who knows that I have a role to play in saving people's souls, it is my role to constantly be dwelling on the will of God and seeing how in every situation that I'm in, I have an opportunity to bring about God's will on earth. That's what it means to have purpose. And that stems from a, a constant knowing that I'm loved. I'm the beloved of God. 
you're the beloved of God. And, and so it is enough of a purpose to sit and to learn and to discover his ways because as you discover his ways, that's going to drive you to do the, the works of God, which is to love people and to meet them where they are. And as we meet people where they are and enact this great love on earth, like that's when we start to recognize that God's doing something bigger in the world than all of the small things that we, we can do added together. And, and he, he's asking and, and giving you the opportunity to participate in that work.